So without further ado, you know, today we're really talking about uh, the impact that your choices in via design have on, you know, your, your high speed uh, signal transmissions. And they obviously play an important role, otherwise we wouldn't be having this webinar. Um, uh, two sentences about Sierra. So Sierra circuits were full service. Uh, everything is captive. So we have our own design team, uh, our own fabrication team, our own assembly team and our own supply chain team uh, to handle components and small box build type things. So uh, we've been around um, doing very complex PCBs as well as quick cycle time uh, PCBs. So if you haven't used us already, please uh, request a quote and see, let's see where that goes. We appreciate that. Again, these are the two speakers. Steve Carney should also be there um, for future. And then here are, here's the table of contents. So we'll talk about the overall impacts and Ernie will set that up as well with his demo. And then we'll talk about some so potential solutions and the manufacturing uh, side of it. So the practical side of it as well and how that impacts cost. So definitely VIAs play a critical role in the high speed uh, signal transmission. So here's some of the ways and how they inf influence the signal integrity. So VIAs can introduce uh, impedance changes along the signal path. So one example, layman's example that I could use is, you know, if you have pipes in your house and the pipes keep changing sizes, you're going to have very irregular water flow. Um, and so that could be an analogy for, you know, the discontinuities that you would have. So doing, due to variations in the via geometries and placements, of your vias, uh, the signals traveling through these different vias may experience skew, uh, resulting in discrepancies in arrival times. So that's one issue. Uh, longer via stub lengths can introduce additional resistance and capacitance, uh, leading to higher signal attenuation. And uh, also when vias are closely spaced, the EM fields generated by adjacent signal traces can interfere with each other, in inducing crosstalk. And then uh, lastly, improper via placement can disrupt the return pass for signals, causing ground bounce and power delivery noise. So these are really important to keep track of as well um, in terms of your via placements. So we're gonna go over design techniques uh, to achieve better signal integrity. And so in managing your via discontinuities, if the via impedance does not match the transmission line impedance, this is when the signals passing through the via may reflect back. And so the magnitude of this reflection depends on the difference between the impedance of the trace and the via at that transition point. And to reduce the impedance discontinuity, uh, you can implement a coaxial via structure where the signal via at the center is surrounded by multiple ground vias. So you need to position the ground vias near the signal vias to create a proper inductance loop for the return current. We're going to do a quick demo of our V impedance calculator. I'll hand it over. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sierra Circuits VR Impedance Calculator uses the physical dimensions of a VR to calculate its capacitance, inductance, and impedance. The tool implements numerical solutions of Maxwell's equations to render accurate and consistent results. The tool supports two types of VR models, through hole and laser VR models. Each of these models have four VR structures, the through hole VR with single and two reference planes and the through hole back drill VR with single and two reference planes. Similarly, for the laser VR, we have the blind and buried VR with single and two reference planes. Uh, for now, let us choose a through hole VR with a single reference plane. Uh, the diagram of the chosen VR model is on the left side and the units can be changed using these drop downs here. Uh, enter the dielectric information now. H1 is the dielectric below the reference plane. Let's take a height of 29.5 and a dielectric constant of 4. H2 is the dielectric above the reference plane. 
Let's take it as 29.5 and a dielectric constant of 3.6. Dielectric constant E3 is the dielectric of the inner surface of the VI here. So let's take it as 1. Uh, for VI information, the VI diameter, we have 6 mils. Antipad diameter, 24 mils. Annular pad, 16 mils. Uh, sorry, uh, annular pad here, 16 mils. The via pad diameter, 7 mils. The via plating thickness, 1 mil. Annular pad thickness of 1.5 mils and a reference plane thickness of 0.7 mils. Click on calculate here. And the capacitance, inductance, characteristic impedance, propagation delay, propagation delay per unit length, and the effective dielectric constant of the chosen geometry will be displayed here. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I'll share my screen again. Oops, sorry. So uh, back drilling is a technique that I'm going to talk about before Ernie gives his demo, which can reduce your via stubs. So a via stub basically is an inactive portion of a via that forms a resonant circuit with a specific frequency. Signals operating at this frequency or its odd harmonics encounter impedance mismatches, leading to the signal attenuation that you don't want. So to prevent signal attenuation caused by via stub resonance, ensure the signal's maximum frequency is significantly lower than the stub's resonant frequency, and this will avoid the excitation of the resonant circuit by the signal. So one effective way to eliminate via stubs is the back drilling. So you can keep the via stub length as at a minimum as possible, um, less than 120 to the resonant uh, wavelength. So from a practical standpoint, uh, DFM tips for uh, back drilling um, are important to know. So ensure that your back drill, of course, is slightly larger than the original uh, drill that you're that you're drilling. So typically it's uh, five mil over the drill size uh, with a pot tolerance of three mils. Um, and then I would say that um, you know you probably need a 10 mil 10 mils of clearance as well. So I would ask Steve Carney to comment on any of these. To me, these are standard rules and guidelines, but we can definitely do better than standard. So, uh, Steve Carney, do you have any comments on DFM for back drill? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, most of our, um, virtually all our drill machines now are the newer setup. So um, the trick, part of the trick is a couple of tricks with back drilling. Um, you need to control the depth that you're going into the board. Um, our machines have a uh, depth control sensor. It's actually a feedback system from the uh, from the top of the panel to the tip of the drill. So now we have the ability to go in and, and tell the program we want to go down 10 mil. Um, the machine senses exactly where the tip of the drill is and goes down 10 mil. So we're with this system, we're able to hold a depth tolerance of plus or minus a half a mil. Um, we use um, part of the problem when you do a back drill, um, you get what we refer to as, as pigtails. Um, so you're kind of pulling up the copper because the hole starts out, the whole hole is barrel plated. So the trick is to get the copper out uh, cleanly. So we use, um, it requires a special uh, point on the drill bit. And then in some cases, we'll uh, use an end mill, which is essentially a flat point. Um, the drill diameter, um, five mils is okay. If you can go a little bigger, um, that's better. It, um, it um, you know, we're, we're removing um, sometimes some fairly heavy plated copper in the hole. So if you try and go too small, um, the uh, the drill bit will, will catch and, and snap in the hole. So it's uh, definitely better to be the five mils above. Um, 
other than that, it's uh, everything looks pretty good. Um, so we do use back drilling um, to clean out the stub. We also use it to um, break connections on layers. So we have that option too. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, so I think that actually there's another demo. Uh, okay, hold on. So this is before and after for back drilling. So yeah, here you have on the left a um, an example of the via stub, and um, you know it's a drill hole with plating in the via, and then you have the back drill happens, and then uh, I guess the pigtail situation that. Steve Carney was talking about in terms of removing the stub, but though this is basically um, the before and after of uh, back drill. Uh, quick, another quick demo. Here you go, Linda. Yes, thank you. Uh, so here we have the maximum VS stub length calculator. Uh, this calculator helps to determine the optimum stub length and its resonant frequency. At resonant frequency, a VS stub functions as a resonant circuit uh, and can store maximum energy. Hence, the length of the VS stub should be within an acceptable range to avoid signal integrity issues. Uh, to calculate the maximum VS stub length, you need to ent enter a dielectric constant, uh, for example, 4, and select one of the input parameters here. That is a maximum data transfer rate, fastest signal rise time, maximum frequency content, or the 3 dB bandwidth. Uh, let's, let's take maximum frequency content, for example, and enter a value of 12 gigahertz and click on calculate stub. So here the maximum via stub length and the resonant frequency along with the remaining parameters, that is the DTR, fastest signal rise time, and the 3 dB bandwidth is calculated and displayed. Uh, Let's take another scenario where I take the maximum data transfer rate and enter seven, for example, and click on calculate stub. Uh, so the values here are calculated and displayed again. Uh, as observed at higher frequencies, for example, the 20 gigahertz, the VR stubs are smaller and can cause serious signal integrity issues. Since micro VR do not have a stub, the VR stub issues can be avoided by lasing laser micro VRs. Thank you. Thanks, Bandana. Okay.